much for those kind of words. You may have noticed that we read the story of the uh, church in Antioch. And that's the passage that I want to go through today. The passage that we read. Uh, it was the first missionary church. And the first uh, reference we have to this church is in chapter 11 and verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. And it's very interesting. Here we are told that these people who shared this gospel were those who were scattered in connection because of the persecution that rose over Stephen. But that was a terrible event. The first martyr had been killed for the sake of for the name of Jesus Christ. A terrible event. And yet, Luke, looking back, saw that something wonderful was going to happen through this. The first Gentile church was going to be formed through the scattering that took place as a result of Stephen's death. And so the word that he used is the word Dias Pharaoh. Uh, Dias Pharaoh is the word that is usually used for the scattering of seed. See, looking back uh, from the benefit of hindsight, Luke realized that these people actually went as refugees away from Jerusalem, but they were missionaries. Even though they were running with fear, when they were going, the seed of the word of God was being scattered. In chapter 8 and verse 1, we are told, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles and then verse 4 they had said now those who were scattered went about preaching the word so the death of Stephen the persecution that resulted from it became the occasion for a great thrust forward in the life of the church. My mentor uh, and my teacher, Dr. Robert Coleman, uh, says that one of the glaring omissions of the modern church growth studies is the key part that suffering has played in the growth of the church. Often before a great movement forward of the gospel people suffer and this was uh, Paul talks about this many times in 2 Corinthians 4 12 he says so death is at work in us but life in you Paul's dying meant life to the church he says in 2 Corinthians 6 10 that concerning his ministry as poor yet making many rich. Talking about the example of a life of giving from the life of Jesus, he describes Jesus like this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's the way the gospel goes. People suffer. And through their suffering, doors are open for the preaching of the gospel. Look at the pioneering ministry in many, many countries. Sri Lanka is a story of people who died so that people will come to Christ. Korea, Nigeria, China, uh, I'm sure maybe the Philippines also. I don't know much of the history of the church in the Philippines. Before the growth, there was suffering. You know, the word martyr, which is now used for a person who died for Christ, comes out of the Greek word martyr, 
Manchuria. Manchuria is the word for victors. So, the early Christians realized that the weakness was to suffer. And so they called somebody who died for Christ a weakness, a martyr. And, uh, and so in Hebrews 12, after the listing of the great heroes of the faith, in chapter 12, uh, in 11, in chapter 12, Paul says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these are people who suffer. To witness is to suffer. And through that, a glorious thing comes to this world. Uh, I can tell you story after story, but I chose one story about uh, a man called George Hunt, who was a medical doctor. And uh, he studied medicine at the University of Yale, uh, at Yale University and then went to London University and got his uh, doctorate, PhD in tropical medicine and then with his young wife he went to, uh, to Liberia uh, as a missionary. He had to, it, uh, his, his center was going to be in a remote jungle. He had to walk 17 days with his pregnant wife to reach this place. And when he went there, he quietly set up his, his hospital and he served the people. The people would come for, for treatment and every, every week they would announce that there is a service. But for five years, no one ever came for the service on Sunday. So five years he served without any visible fruit. But then the child who was born, when they went there, uh, got sick and uh, the child got worse and finally died. It was a terrible day for the life of this couple and um, uh, they had no one to make a coffin so he himself made it and then he himself uh, dug the grave and there was one uh, Nigerian, an African, who was looking at him, doing all of this. And then he placed the body in the grave and then he could hold it no longer. He just put his face in the sand and he began to weep. And this African looked at this and he ran back to the village. And he said, the white man cries like us. The white man cries like us. The next Sunday, the hall was full. People had come for the service. George Ali served there for 35 years. He was one of the, he's one of the great names in the history of Liberia. He's a man who uh, made the first lap uh, uh, first man of Liberia and he also uh, sorry it's not Liberia it's Ghana uh, the first man of Ghana he is the man who did that he also made some pioneering discoveries about malaria through the death of that son the door opened and the gospel went down that is a pattern that has been repeated right through history and people have come from Europe and suffered so that we people might hear the gospel. Now it is our chance. Now it is our chance to take the cross and to follow in service in bringing people to the foot of Jesus. So that's the first thing we find out. That this, the, the terrible tragedy of, uh, of Stephen's death became the occasion for the growth of the church. Now the next thing we see about this is that the names of the people who started this church is not mentioned. The church was founded, the first Gentile church was founded by unknown pioneers. 
Verse 20 says, But there were some men, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand was of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now here is what William Barclay calls one of the greatest events in history. And their names are not known. They are not, they are not, give, they are not given. Probably Luke realized these are people whom the church doesn't know anything about. Possibly he himself didn't know who had started this church. So he says where they are from, but not who they are. You see, known people may not be doing the most significant work of the gospel. There are some people who are known by the church. I have written books. Because I wrote books, people know my name. But there are others, but that I know is not a measure of my success. That will be known when I get to heaven. And what I have to be careful about, about is, have I been faithful to the call that God gave me? So let us remember that some of the greatest servants of the church today are people whom very few know about. But they are there among the lost, among the unreached, preaching the gospel, doing the heroic work of expanding the borders of the kingdom of God. Let's be careful about living for earthly recognition. I think I mentioned on Sunday, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, 5 and 16. Three times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, they have their reward. You see, they were recognized. They did their work for recognition. And they got the recognition. But they, they didn't receive. Uh, they, they, their reward was spent on earth. There was nothing left for them in heaven. So, let's remember that some of the greatest work of the gospel is being done by unknown pioneers in unknown areas. But the problem with the new church uh, started by unknown people is that they don't have the credentials. And so, the early church needed to send a mature mentor to this vibrant new church. They, they realized that uh, uh, they wanted to know, is this a legitimate church? Who are these people? And what a wise choice they made. Barnabas. Also not Cyprus, some of the people who came were from Cyprus. Barnabas. And it's very interesting. Verse 22 says, the report of, of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Um, now, now this is something that is very important with a new work. New works need others to go to encourage that work. Um, we mustn't neglect the unknown workers toiling for the kingdom in pioneer areas. They face, they face much discouragement and loneliness. Uh, they could make erroneous decisions when they are under pressure. So we have to make sure that more mature people can go as mentors to encourage them and to help them. So that's what happened. They sent Barnabas. Now we are told when Barnabas came, verse 23, he saw the grace of God and was glad. Uh, there must have been a lot of weaknesses in this church. I'm sure there would have been. But he recognized grace. And when he recognized grace, he was glad. You know, I'm a left hander. So when I see somebody writing with the left hand, immediately I know, oh, there's a fellow left hand. Because uh, that, that, uh, that's special to me. To one to whom grace is special, recognizes grace when he sees that. And he may have seen the weaknesses, but he focused on grace. And that grace made him glad. People 
who, what an encouragement that must have been to this church to know that the leader from Jerusalem was happy when he saw them. Uh, there is, it's very interesting, there is a connection between grace and joy. Actually, both come from the same Greek root. Uh, those of you who know Greek, the two words are chi and ro. Uh, charis means joy. And the, the uh, sorry, grace means charis. And kara means joy. Uh, here, of course, is the verb, which is kairo. So both have kai and ro. So uh, uh, there's a connection. You see, when you experience God's grace, it brings joy. Actually, we can put another word there. Eucharistio also has the same root, the root which is uh, which is thanksgiving. You, when you are thankful, oh my goodness, look at what God has done to me. He has saved me. You're, you're, you're thankful. And thankful people are happy people. So grace brings thanksgiving. And then thanksgiving brings joy. And if you want, we can put another word there. This is Eucharistio. which is to freely give. That means, out of the joy of having received grace, we are able to serve God. We can freely give of our services. So, grace is an important aspect of the Christian life. If those who focus on grace are happy people, and um, uh, if they focus on their work, on what they are doing, and on the significance of what they are doing, well, they are going to be always comparing that work with others. And such people will never be happy. And the result is that they don't make other people happy also. So, there is so much cynicism in the church today. Um, people look at everything with a cynical eye. Not if you are meditating on grace. Because whatever we see in the world, Jesus remains Wonderful. His grace remains wonderful. You know, um, Romans 5 20 says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Yes, there is a lot of sin in the world, but greater than the greatest sin is the love of God. And so, uh, we, we, we can remember that. And, and I just want to challenge you, you know, in, as, as we face life, as we get busy, as we have all these pressures, as people hurt us and we get upset, sometimes we could lose the sight of grace. Our vision could become a little ungracious. And then we lose the joy. And when we lose the joy, we lose the strength of ministry. How important it is for us to focus back on grace. Sometimes when I'm um, having my devotions, I realize I've got trying. So many problems, so many things I'm thinking about, praying about. And I think, let me stop my intercessions today and just let me go and sing a few hymns. And so I'll spend about an hour singing hymns, reminding myself on the wonderful grace of Jesus. So my dear friend, we have a religion of grace. There was an old missionary who had been a missionary for 73 years. Uh, he had gone as a missionary when he was 17 years old to some tribal place. And for 73 years he had served there. And he went, he was speaking in a church uh, and uh, to a youth group. And you know how 90 year old people repeat the same thing over and over again. Well, this man kept telling them, now I'm not going to say much to you. I just, I'm going to say one thing. So don't forget that. That's what I want to tell you. And he just kept saying that over and over and over again. And the young people were wanting to tell him, say what you have to say, say what you have to say. And, uh, and finally, he 
said what he had to say. And he said it and sat down. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. When the joy goes, the strength goes. We minister out of joy because Jesus has been wonderful. And so when Barnabas came, he saw grace and he was filled with joy. And that would have been a great encouragement to the people there. And then we are told in verse 23 and the second part, and he exalted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. That's what he wanted to tell this new Christian. Remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Uh, what is intended there, what is meant there is cling, cling to God. And that's what we want more than anything else for our people. Stay close to Jesus. Whatever happens, stay close to Jesus. And so, when we think of people, we ask, most of all, are they staying close to Jesus? Are they spending their time with God? Are they living obedient lives? Are they faithful husbands? Faithful wives? Faithful parents? Faithful children in obedience to God? Do, uh, uh, do, do they give God first place in their life? Uh, this is how we can, people can progress to cling to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. So, uh, this is what Barnabas did. And then in verse 24, we are given his character. The character of an encourager. He was a man, uh, a, a good man, we are told. Full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. He was a good man. You know, this, this word good, it, uh, in, in, uh, Paul uses the same word and says, for a righteous man, uh, the animal will die. But for a good man, people may think of dying. There is something about a good man that inspires loyalty and trust. A good man is a person that you look at him and say, you know, sometimes people are saying something and you wonder, now I wonder what he's really saying. You know, he's saying something, but I wonder what he's really saying. Because you can't trust their word. A good man's words could be trusted. How we need good people in the church today. How we need people of integrity. I remember we had a crisis in our ministry once and one of our staff workers had left and he left quite upset. So his volunteers were very upset with us and me as a leader. So I called the volunteers and I wanted to talk to them and ask them and talk to them and try and explain what had happened. And as I was explaining and they were responding, I realized they are not believing. They think I'm lying. And it was a shock to me. These people think I'm lying. In other words, they had come to the point of feeling that leaders can't be trusted. They have seen people being used by others. People saying things but actually meaning something else. People commanding people, saying this is God's work, when it was actually, this is my agenda. And they couldn't trust people. You know, uh, we need people who, uh, who are good people. And actually, the next one says how you can be a good person. He was full of the Spirit. In the book of Acts, the, the term full of the Spirit is used in two ways. One is to describe people uh, for, for some, uh, what we call anointing. You know, that we go with the anointing, filled with the Spirit, to fulfill a certain task. And the Bible, there are different examples. Uh, Peter, filled with the Spirit, spoke to the Sanitary. Uh, Stephen, filled with the Spirit, got ready to die. Um, Paul, filled with the Spirit, rebuked animals. So this was the fully filling of the Spirit for uh, some, some work, anointing. The other way is to describe the character of a person. So 
so when they chose six, uh, seven elders, uh, seven deacons, uh, they had to be filled with the Spirit. Barnabas is described as a person filled with the Spirit. Stephen is described as a person filled with the Spirit. When you saw him, you, you realize this man is like Jesus. So his character showed the nature of Christ. There's a story told about a, a missionary, John Selvin, who had gone to the, uh, to the uh, South Pacific Island and he had a home for children. And uh, one of the boys in the home was very disobedient. And he just kept, you know, uh, you know, rebelling, rebelling, rebelling. So one day he had done something wrong. And John Selvin rebuked him. And uh, he, uh, he, when he rebuked him, this boy slapped John Selvin. And John Selvin realized the best thing now is just to go away. So he didn't do anything. He just turned and left. This boy went from bad to worse until finally he had to be sent home. 50, 60 years later, there's an old man who's sick and he wants to become a Christian. So he calls the pastor and uh, the pastor explains the gospel and he uh, accepts Christ and he uh, gets baptized, this boy. As an old man now, he has wanted to become a Christian. And when he took this new uh, baptism, the pastor asked him, now that you are baptized as a Christian, would you like to take a new name? And this man said, call me John Selby. Because I found out what Jesus was like the day that I slapped him. When he slapped him, by the response, he saw what Jesus was like. So here was a man filled with the Spirit. And then we are told he was full of faith. You see, it's faith that gives us the, uh, the ability to be good people. It's so easy to get certain things done by lying, by cutting somebody, by taking revenge, by slandering, by gossiping. So easy for us to achieve quick results in this way. But those who have faith say, no, 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 no. God is more powerful than these methods. God is so great that he doesn't need for us to use the methods of sin to achieve God's ends. I believe God. I refuse to break my principles. And so a good man has to be a man of faith. A person who believes that God is worth following completely because he will look after those who follow him. But also this is needed for encouragement because with faith we look at people through the eyes of the possibilities of grace. We see a person with all his weaknesses all his, all the problems, immaturity. But we can see beyond that immaturity and weakness and see the grace of Jesus. And trusting in the ability of God's grace to make people new, we encourage them. We don't give up on them. And we give ourselves to the ministry of encouragement. So here we have the character of an encourager. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Well, it's very interesting because we are told in the second part of verse 24 that and great many people were added to the Lord. The encourager had come but with the coming of the encourager evangelism didn't stop. Very often, after an initial burst of evangelistic activity, the fervor is lost. Uh, they have to, the church has to uh, look about many other things now. And so because of that, little by little, evangelism could uh, go down. But that's not what happened in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, in chapter 2, 
and verse 47 after the first church had formed we are told that they gave themselves to the fellowship and the bible to the, to the teaching of the prophet of the apostles and you know all of that we have a nice description uh, of the early church of the community life but at the end of that description it says and the lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved uh, then uh, after the, they have preached the gospel and they are the first persecution comes and they are told don't preach again in the name of christ and then they come tell the christians and they pray and in their prayer they said give us boldness to preach your word with boldness and then uh, we are told at the end of that prayer and with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the lord jesus and grace was upon them all so they were told don't preach and they are preaching just as they are told not to preach then chapter 5 problems have come in the church Ananias and Sapphira have died and there is discipline and these two people die and great fear falls upon the church but verse 14 says that is from verse 1 to 11 verse 14 of chapter 5 of Acts says more than ever believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women then the next chapter chapter 6 the first major administrative reshuffle has taken place now there is a need for pastoral care people need to be looked after the, the widows need to be fed properly and so they appoint six, seven elders, uh, seven deacons and then after that description verse 7 says and the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples multiplied greatly and great many of the priests became obedient to the faith in the chapter, of chapter 7 where Stephen uh, serves and is killed and then chapter 8 says and those who were scattered abroad went about preaching the word every stage in the development of the church the result was evangelism because that was the priority that was the thing that Jesus had kept telling them over and over again before he left go and preach in different ways he just kept pushing that like a good leader he motivated the people by giving them their mission and that's what they did you know it's very important for us leaders to make sure that evangelism has the priority it's important for us to have our leaders meetings to have at the at the at the bottom of it the heartbeat of evangelism so sometimes our leaders meetings are so dominated by evangelists uh, by administrative concerns that that we can send the unconscious message that evangelism is not an essential ingredient of the life of the church when leaders meet they must be thinking how can we take the message out and so um, a, a leader without an evangelistic passion spells death to the movement there's this famous statement evangelize or fossilize evangelize or fossilize if we don't evangelize we will soon become fossils well new movements need teaching so what happens was that from verse 22 to 26 we are told that uh, that uh, uh, rather from 24 to 26 so Barnabas went uh, and uh, went to Tarsus to look for Saul and when he had found him he brought him to Antioch and for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians so a new church must evangelize but they also have to teach and that goes on uh, somebody has said about the church in Asia and Africa that it's a mile wide and an inch deep 
In other words, there's a lot of growth, but no, no teaching. If you don't remedy that situation, we could end up with a dark age in Asia and Africa, where people profess Christianity, but don't practice Christianity, because they haven't been told. They do the same things that they, they do uh, before. You know, they might stop smoking and drinking and things like that. But the same old unkindness to their wife uh, or uh, taking revenge or gossiping or lying, <laughs> things like that still continue. So, uh, so there was teaching. Uh, but uh, it's very interesting that uh, uh, when, they, when they go, Barnabas goes in search of Saul. Now, Tarsus was about 160 miles from Antioch. Uh, ten years had elapsed uh, after Saul had left Jerusalem for Tarsus. And uh, the word used here that he went in search of him is a word that means to try to locate by searching. Uh, he may not have known where Paul really did because it was so long. But he went. He, he went 160 kilometers, or simply walking. And then he searched and found out Paul. Now he must have been very motivated to make such an effort to, to find Paul. Um, but he was going to find a person who was ultimately going to eclipse it who's going to be ahead of him. Um, uh, key leaders do not need to fear enlisting capable colleagues. You know, this is something we don't have to fear. When they do well, and they do better than us, we may be tempted to be envious. That's normal. We are human. When, when more people come to hear our young junior than hear us, the natural response is to be envious. But the Bible says, we overcome evil with good. And so, we overcome that evil, envy, by doing something good for that person. And that's what Barnabas did. He gave uh, Saul the freedom to fly, and he became the great apostle of the church. Uh, in the, about a century ago, or a little less than a century ago, uh, there were two great Bible teachers. Uh, one was 17 years older than the other, and he was the best known preacher at that time, the Bible teacher. His name was F.P. Meyer. And um, then, uh, and he used to preach every year, or very often, he used to preach at D.L. Moody's uh, camps, conferences in Massachusetts, Northfield, Massachusetts. And you know, in those conferences you, you have the freedom to come for the sessions you want to come for. So when he preaches, always the place will be crowded. Then this young Campbell Morgan began to come. And little by little, more people were going to hear Campbell Morgan than S.P. Meyer. And if Pimaya says he was tempted to feel angry, uh, envious of the popularity that Morgan was getting. And how did he overcome that envy? By praying for God to bless Campbell Morgan every day. How can you overcome evil? He overcome it with good. Then Campbell Morgan's success becomes his success. The great thing about the kingdom is that it should grow, not that we should become prominent. If the kingdom grows, that's what we want. And that's the kind of leader that Barnabas was. He went in search of, uh, of, of Paul. And then we are told in verse 27 that prophets came from Jerusalem now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So there's going to be a famine. And the church in Jerusalem was apparently a poor church. 
But the old people came to die in Jerusalem, I suppose. None of them became Christians. So there was less money in Jerusalem. And so what happened? We are told that the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is another great step in the life of the church. The daughter church is sending money to the mother church. And the era of partnership has been born. Now, Jerusalem sent the gospel, but they didn't have much money. The daughter church has money. So the daughter church sends money to the mother church. And there's a reversal of missionary roles. No longer is there a donor and the receiver. Now they have been partner, become partners in the great cause of missions. Partnership is born. Romans 1, 11 and 12. Paul talks about his uh, pro prospective visit to Rome. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Then he says, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Encouragement. You help us, we help you. So now today, missions is from everywhere to everywhere. God has a way of using everybody to bring forth the gospel. Um, now I think there are some requirements for us to have this partnership model. One is that we need a body of Christ mentality. In other words, we need to remember that the body, the same body is found everywhere. Uh, and each member of the body has been given special gifts for the common good. That everyone has gifts. And uh, because of that, uh, Philippians 2, 3, in humility we count others better than ourselves. Poor churches that don't have much money have a lot to contribute to the, uh, to the world church. Uh, I work mainly with very poor people. And those people have taught me a lot about prayer. Because they, have, they know what it is to depend on God. And that gives them a decided advantage in the spiritual life. Because it, it's more natural for them to become people of prayer. So even though they are poor physically, they are rich spiritually because they are rich in a life of prayer. It's the same with the, the poor and generosity. I'm amazed at how generous poor Christians are. So we can learn from them. I still remember going to one of our new centers in the north of Sri Lanka. And it was a brand new center. And we were having an evangelistic meeting and I was going to speak at the meeting. And uh, this, uh, this was about in the 80s, in the early 80s. And, uh, or the mid 80s and um, they started the program with a long time of worship now in Young for Christ those days we started programs because there are non-Christians in the uh, audience so we didn't even say a prayer at the start because we didn't want the non-Christians to feel out of place we have games and what we call crowd breakers and, and we do this and then and slowly, slowly we begin to share the gospel. Here, these people are starting with worship. And I thought to myself, what is this? This is not youth for Christ. We have to tell these people that our methods are a little different. But later, I realized that the Hindu people who had come for this meeting appreciated worship. They liked to hear there was something vibrant about the Christians worship and this brand new ministry taught the mature ministry of youth for Christ an important aspect of evangelistic strategy and that is worship evangelism that God can use worship to draw people to himself so we need a body of Christ mentality and secondly money must not rule mission if money rules mission, then we'll keep the donor-receiver mentality continuing. The mother church and the gospel 
the daughter church sent money. Those who are poor must never feel that they are inferior to those who are rich. And that can happen when we, when, when money, the stranglehold of money on mission is taken away, it's loose, and the gospel remains uppermost in mission. Um, you know, in the early church, uh, people were all rich people, poor people, everybody was worshipping worshiping together, men and women, uh, slaves and free, rich and poor, that people thought there is some magic here. They are doing some magic. There is no other way in which these people can all get together than this. And, and they, 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 are, uh, they, they thought that some magic had been done. So, uh, so, so we need to uh, rediscover this, this, this aspect of we are the body of Christ and everybody is equal. Well, we come to chapter 13 and we find that, they, uh, that the first thing we find about this church here is that they had a culturally diverse leadership. I'm not going to spend much time on that, uh, but just let me say that cultural diversity uh, helps demonstrate the reality of, the, of how Christ breaks barriers. And I know this is a Chinese church, uh, most of the people here are Chinese. And yet, within the Chinese culture also, you will have cultural differences, age differences, uh, other, other differences like that. And when you have a diverse leadership, in an unusual way, it demonstrates the power of Christ and also shows how uh, each, each different culture can contribute a richness of its own to give a beautiful harmony in the life of the church. So I will, uh, I will go from that. And the next point also I will not spend much time on. Uh, these people, we are told, uh, they, were, uh, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Uh, when they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. So these people were activists involved in ministry, in missions, but they were also worshippers. And so in God's, in God's kingdom, worshippers and activists go together. Some people say, you pray, I work. But in the, in the Bible, prayer is work. Uh, the word for worship, later on here, actually meant originally in, in Greek, uh, in, uh, in classical Greek, it meant serve for a voluntary service done for the state. So our worship is something that we do as service to God. So these people were worshippers and they were workers. They were activists. Let's get on to the next one. They are praying. Uh, prayer as a preparation for the spirit to break through. These people are praying and when they are praying, the Holy Spirit says to them, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Uh, so while they are praying in unity, God breaks through with a message and mission, real mission, start. Uh, and, uh, and that's how you can. That prayer does, when people get together, uh, uh, there is a close connection between the activity of the Holy Spirit and prayer. Uh, this is particularly so in the writings of Luke. Only Luke mentions that when Jesus, uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he was praying uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Uh, before the before Pentecost, they are told that the believers devoted themselves to united prayer. They were with one accord devoting themselves to prayer. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. And now, while they are praying, the Holy Spirit speaks to them. You know, one of the most exciting uh, uh, subjects 
in the history of the Christian church is what happens when people get together in united prayer how God speaks to them. I think of the haystack movement. This was a movement that began about uh, 211 years ago. Uh, and this was uh, in, uh, in, in America, in the, in, in, in the universities, uh, there was a particular university uh, called Williams College, where it was a Christian school, but the spiritual life had really gone down. And so a few students had a burden for revival. So they started meeting to pray regularly. And of course people started giving them a hard time, so they had to leave the campus and go to the forest that was near the campus to pray. And one day, when they were praying, it started raining. So they had run, they had to run to shelter to a haystack. And in that, at that meeting, uh, when they were praying at that on this haystack, the leader of this of, of the movement of this group said, We have to think of missions also. We are praying for revival, but we need to be thinking of missions. There are so many people in Africa and Asia who haven't heard the gospel. Someone has to take the gospel to these people. And uh, the group felt that God touched them that day. And there was a strong sense of the spirit moving these people. And the leader said, we will do this if we will. And th that became the motto of this group. We will do this if we will. And this passion for missions, they uh, uh, hit them so strongly that they began to go to other universities. And then from that university to another. And there was a groundswell of missionary interest among university students. And that is what began the great missionary movement that came out of America. I think it's one of the most exciting uh, you know, so many thousands of missionaries have gone out of North America. And, it, and, and this movement began with a few students saying, let's pray. This, this story is very special to us because all five of those students went uh, to different places. And one of them came to Sri Lanka. And he served in Sri Lanka. So things happen when people get together to pray. Uh, I just want to uh, challenge you. If you have a burden, look for somebody else with that burden and start praying. And you don't know what God will do. I've had a burden for my country, uh, uh, for, for our ministry, you to Christ, a certain burden. And I found two people who share the same burden. And now we meet. We meet to pray. And we believe that God is going to do something. So when God uh, gives us a burden, find others with that burden and start praying. And there is no telling what God might do. Well, we come to verse 3, which says that after the Holy Spirit had spoken to them, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, uh, here, there would have been a lot of work to do in Antioch. It was, a brand, it was a fairly new church. So many things to do. The two senior pastors that just been getting settled with their new task of leading this growing church. And what did the Holy Spirit come and do? He says, send your two best people, Barnabas and Saul, for mission to go to the Gentiles to preach the gospel to the outreach, uh, to, to the unreached. That's how important the unreached are. The best percent to preach the gospel to them. Right through history, some of the most brilliant people in the church are those who went to the unreached. This doesn't mean that only brilliant people by the world's standards are those who are going to the average. For my devotions today I read that God uses the weak things uh, of the world to confound the strong. And so 
God, but the history of the church shows that some of the most capable, brilliant people are those who went to the unreached. You know, today because there is such a strong sense of values in the church, we think of that, we may think of that as scandalous. If, if the church, if somebody came to the church and told the senior pastor and the second most important pastor, go now, you go and preach to the unreached, people would say, but he's such a good preacher. And if he goes to the unreached, what is the kind of congregation he's going to have? Three people, him, his wife, and his colleague. Just the three of them. Such a great preacher. But that's how important the lost are. We must capture God's heart for the lost. You know, Henry Martin said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary must we become. Henry Martin was a brilliant mathematician. He was, he liked a girl, but God called him to Leave that girl because she didn't feel she was called to, to, to come to India. To leave prospects of a bright future in England and to come to India and then to Iran to translate the Bible into the Hindustan language and then the Iranian language. So my dear friends, the unreached are important. And this is the burden of the Bible. You find Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem and saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You find him, that's in Luke 13, 34. In Luke 19, 41 and 42, you find him weeping over Jerusalem. In Matthew 9, 36, we are told that he saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion that because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said, Pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest field. And Paul, later on, in Romans 9, verses 2 and 3, says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from, uh, from, from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Such was his passion for the lost. Oh, may we recover something of that passion for lost people. Today we don't like to use the word passion for souls. Say, use the word passion for people. You can use whatever word you want. But let's remember, people are lost without Christ. They need the Savior. So, all of us are involved in this. This is something that all of us should be involved in. God calls some to go. And maybe he's speaking to somebody here today and saying, will you be open to going as a missionary amongst the unreached? God calls some to go. And we need to keep challenging people that the call of God remains. Uh, uh, there was a great missionary in, uh, in India called Stanley Joe. He served his whole life ministering to the intellectuals of India. And when he was a student at Asbury College in the USA, as a university student, he was conducting a prayer meeting. And God impressed on him that on that day, that prayer meeting, one person is going to respond to the mission field. So he prayed, 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 and went for the meeting. And they had a prayer time, a message. And at the end of the meeting, he said, Those, I know God has told someone here to come as a missionary. Who is that person? He waited and waited and waited. And no one responded. He went to his room feeling really downcast. Lord, I thought you told me that someone is going to respond. And he felt he was hearing the voice of God saying, It is you, Sandy. It is you. And he responded. His mother was furious because he, he was a brilliant student. 
and he, she was hoping he'd become a lawyer. And actually, he did become a lawyer and a witness for Christ, speaking on behalf of the gospel of Christ. So some are called to go. You know, uh, the people have studied the missionary movement in India. Uh, from between 1975 to 1990, there was a great movement of professionals who were going from the south to the north to share the gospel. Engineers, doctors, uh, people like that. And then, in the 90s, this began to get a little less. And analysts asked, what is it that has caused this lessening of fervor for going to the unreached? And they said, the younger generation is more concerned for security, for the future, and for financial stability. And they are reluctant to volunteer for missions. Let me just say, is God calling someone here? Well, my friends, if God is calling you, the safest place to be is where God calls you to be. That's where the greatest security some are called to release, like the church in Antioch. They were asked to set apart. They are most talented people for the work of missions. So, God asks parents to release their children. God asks the church to release their people to go to the unreached. Um, I think I mentioned somewhere that, that uh, most missionaries in the earlier centuries, when they went to the mission field, their parents were disappointed. They were not happy. Uh, I was led to Christ by my mother. She taught me the Bible from the time I was a child. And even though I am a Bible teacher today, I can honestly say that the greatest and most influential Bible teacher in my life was my mother. And then the time came for me to go to America to study. And uh, my mother knew that when I go, in a sense, I'm not going to come back. Because I'm going to come back into a ministry. And God called me to work with the poor, with new believers. And so we, my wife and I, had to become parents to a lot of people who didn't have Christian parents. And in a sense, I had to leave it to my brothers and sisters uh, to look after my mother, which they did very well. So I didn't have this sense of guilt because they did it well and allowed me to do my work. The morning that I was leaving for America, and then I was away for four and a half years, then I came and started working with you for Christ. My mother read in her devotions Psalm chapter, Psalm, the fourth Psalm. And when she came to verse 3, God clearly spoke to her. Verse 3 says, But no, that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And that day, the Lord told my mother, your son has been set apart. Let him go. And she released me. And she prayed for me. And she supported me in that work. So my dear friends, some of you may be called to release your children to the work of God and to be their support. And the church in, in Antioch also became the church that encouraged Paul. Paul often came back to this church to report and to set off. Two of his missionary journeys he set off from Antioch. And so others are called to help. Some are called to go. Some are called to release. Others are called to help. And we help through giving, through letters, through visits, and through encouragement. Some people give. Well, actually all should be given. Some uh, help, uh, uh, send letters, and encourage these people. They, they call, they send WhatsApp messages, and things like that. Others will visit these people and others will encourage them to help them in their work. Uh, there was a church, uh, in a small church in Toronto and uh, they hired a new pastor 
pastor's name was Oswald J. Smith, young pastor. And they didn't tell the pastor about the financial situation of the church because they thought if they tell him that, he will refuse the invitation. The church was terribly in debt. And so after he had accepted the invitation, they told him, Pastor, we need to tell you the church is terribly in debt. So Oswald J. Smith came and started preaching. His first Sunday, he preached on missions. And the people from Little Body, here's the church that is in debt and is preaching on missions. So they were aware, first Sunday, they did be. Second Sunday, again, he's preached on missions. Now they are really worried. Third Sunday, again, he's preaching on missions. That church became Canada's largest missionary sending church. It became, it's called the People's Church in Toronto. Large number, many, many different races worshipped there. And it became a church that just gave and gave and gave. Every church should be involved in missions. So here's a portrait of a missionary church. The first great missionary church started by unknown people but people who did a significant work encouraged by a person a good man who was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith committed to praying listening to the voice of God as it gives financially to mission and then gives its best the mission field. May that be said of the Grace Gospel Church. May God use this church and may God speak to the people in this church in a fresh way at this conference and say, I want you to be involved in a good way. Let's pray. We thank you, our Father for the excitement of being part of this work that you have called us to do. Thank you, Father, that for each one of us there is a call. Some to go, all to give, all to help. May we find our place in that call and do what you wish for us to do. In Jesus' name.